Please be seated. At this time, I invite the children to come forward for a message just for them. saved. Every single one of you whose name shall be found written in the book. Mom. <laughs> Do you have any idea what that means? Any idea what that means at all? No. So, what, what, what the author here is talking about is God has a book. Do you guys have books? Yes. Do you like to read books? No. Have you ever seen a book that's just full of names? Do you know what a phone book is? No, the phone book. Yeah, yeah. So, a phone book is a book of, of names of, of people and phone numbers. Uh, you have a lot of books. That's great. God has a book too, and in God's book are written a whole bunch of names. Every single person who's going to be in heaven, their name is written in that book, and your names are written in that book. And one day, when we get to see God, God's going to take out His book. He's going to look at it, and He's going to find your name. He's going to say, "I saved you. You're, you're mine. And you get to be with me in heaven." And so today, what, the, what this Bible reading wants us to know is that God loves you so much that he wrote your name down in heaven. He knows who you are, and one day you're going to get to be with him. So let's thank God for that. Let's do that now. Let's pray. I'll say the words. You guys pray them to God, and the congregation will join you. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for writing my name in your book. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming, guys. You go back to your seats. And our service continues to sing in our next hymn.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who loved you with his very life. Amen. So the, uh, the, our second reading today comes from the book of Hebrews. Uh, and the book of Hebrews is just a, it's a, it's a theological treasure. Uh, the book of Hebrews really does this, this amazing job at taking a very, a very deep look at the Old Testament and how people worship God back in the Old Testament. And then it compares that, that worship to, to the New Testament to see how people worship God after Jesus has come, after Jesus fulfilled the, the systems of the Old Testament. What I mean by that is, is God established certain ways of, of doing worship back in the Old Testament um, at Mount Sinai. He had very specific rules for like how worship is supposed to look, the, what people are supposed to do, the sacrifices that are offered, um, and God did all this on purpose. And so like if you've ever tried one of those read the Bible in a year plans, when you get to March, you get to all of those rules. Um, that's what the book of Leviticus is about and the book of Numbers is about. Um, these very important things about how God wants worship to be done. And the reason that God wants worship to be done that very specific way is that when Jesus came, he was going to fulfill all of those worship kinds of things. All of the sacrifices, all of the priestly roles, all of the prophet roles, all of that. And the book of Hebrews explains, explains why. And so as, as the Old Testament establishes these things that Jesus is going to do, uh, for example, um, we're familiar with a couple of them. Um, one of the things that we call Jesus is we call Jesus the Lamb of God. Right? That's a phrase we've all heard, we, we sing it in church, um, that Jesus is, is the Passover Lamb. So back in the Old Testament, um, on a particular day, on Passover, a lamb was sacrificed, its blood was poured out and painted on doorposts, and it saved people from sins. Jesus is the Lamb of God in the New Testament. And Jesus was sacrificed on Passover, and his blood covers all of our sins. And so God's judgment passes over us. So we see an Old Testament rule and how, how Jesus fulfills it. And Hebrews takes this and takes it up to an 11 and explains this kind of thing in great detail, like our text that we have before us today. Right? In today's text, the author of the Hebrews looks at how we do things on a normal Sunday when we gather here in, in, this, physical, in this physical building, and he explores the why do we do the worship things the way that we do the worship things. And he's talking more than just using divine service setting three. Like, normally, normally when we think about worship, we think about what goes on up here, up here in the front, right? The, uh, we, think about, we think about prayers, we think about the readings, we think about the sermon just now, we think about the Lord's Supper, and, and, and so on. And all of that is very important, and Hebrews will talk about why we do that. But nonetheless, in, in today's passage from Hebrews, the author changes the focus of worship services from up front, and he kind of flips the camera around to look at you guys. And what's going on with you, the worshiper? Why are you here today in the worship service? And Hebrews is going to look at the Old Testament, he's going to look at the New Testament, he's going to say, this is why you're here gathered in the worship service today. The person who gathers um, in this place to worship God will receive, uh, receive the sacraments, they'll, they'll pray, they'll, they'll worship and all of that. But Hebrews wants us to see a, a spiritual reality of, of you. The spiritual reality of specifically you being specifically here in this physical space today. And so this morning, we're going to take a look at this text. Um, a couple of verses at the end of our reading. If you want to follow along, you can do so on the back of your service folder and the Bibles in your pews. Um, we're going to be starting at verse 19, towards the end of our passage today. This is what it says. Uh, Therefore, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, uh, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and for since we have this great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. So what's going on here? This is like asking, you know, what's, uh, what's the phone book like? Uh, what's, what's, what's happening here? 
The author of Hebrews is, is bringing up very important parts of what it was like to worship God back in the Old Testament. And he's talking about all of this Old Testament language and putting it on us here living after the New Testament, how things have changed since Jesus. So a little bit of background will we'll go a long way. So when God gave, gave his people plans and how he wants them to worship, when God said, this is how you're supposed to worship me, uh, way back at Mount Sinai, God gave plans for a building called the tabernacle. Um, the tabernacle was a church that was a tent that moved around. Um, and he gave very specific dimensions that I'm like the size of the, the curtains and whatever it is. Um, and inside the tabernacle, there was this very, very important room. Um, you've heard of it before. It's called the Holy of Holies, um, or, or the holiest place. Um, this is where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. So if you recall from the last time you watched Indiana Jones, remember the, the Ark of the Covenant is this special box that God takes around with him. This box was, was special because on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, between the two angels that were there, was God's physical presence on earth. If you wanted to be where God was, you went to where the Ark was. If you wanted to go where the Ark was, you went to the Holy of Holies, inside, inside the tabernacle, and one day in, inside the temple. And this place was called the Holy of Holies because that's where God's presence was. Because God was there, only one person could enter that room one day each year. And he would bring in one sacrifice to offer to God. And that's called the Day of Atonement, when all of the sins of all of the people would be paid for. And so that, that person was the high priest. And now he couldn't just, just walk in. If he would just walk in there any day, God would literally smite him. And so he went through a series of steps to be made clean, to enter the room, lest he die. And the author of Hebrews knows all of this background extremely well, and he assumes that all of us know all of this background extremely well when he writes this. And so he compares this, this thing, this high priest entering the Holy of Holies to offer the sacrifice, to what Jesus did on the cross when he died on Good Friday. If you remember from the Gospels, um, the authors tell us one important detail, the moment that Jesus died. It says when Jesus died, the temple curtain, that's the curtain by the Holy of Holies, was ripped in half, from top to bottom, split into two. The door that separated the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant, from the rest of the people was broken. And here in our text, the author tells us why that's a huge deal. That how you, the people gathered here in the church today, have changed because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, you now get to worship God differently. There's this, this word that he says over and over and over again in our passage, and that's the word we. This isn't about priests, this isn't about pastors, this is about you, people in the pews, who have this, this spiritual reality today of worship. We, we have confidence to enter into the holy place. We have confidence to enter into God's presence by the blood of Jesus in this new and living way that he opened for us through this curtain. So you, as this, this person today, get to come up here and you get to come into God's presence. Today in worship, you get to enter into the, the Holy of Holies and not have to worry about being smited. You get to come up here into God's presence because Jesus died on the cross to make you clean in a way that not even the high priest Aaron himself was made clean back in the Old Testament. Jesus' sacrifice, that Jesus has so completely and totally forgiven you, forgiven all of your sins, your past sins, your present sins, your future sins. You are so cleansed by the blood of Jesus that you now have direct access to the altar of God. And there is no curtain hanging here separating you from God. 
Because Jesus did all of this for you, you now approach God. Which is your spiritual reality today here in worship. Today, you are going to approach the actual living God. You're going to come up here into God's presence, into this, this holy of holies. You're going to be gathered around the altar. You're going to hold out your hand, and you're going to receive God in it. Take and eat. This is my body. And you get to approach God without fear because of what Jesus did on the cross. So as the words in our text say, let us draw near, let's approach God with a true heart, full of the assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, because Jesus has so forgiven you by shedding his blood on the cross, our bodies washed with pure water because you have been baptized into Christ. You are baptized, you are confirmed, welcome to the Holy of Holies. So now we have this, this, this picture, this image of what takes place, this, this spiritual reality of worship today, that you get to, get to do all of this, but that's not the whole picture. That's the camera still focused up front, but the author turns the camera around and focuses it back on you. Our text doesn't end there. It continues in verse 23. This is what he says. So, uh, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see that day is drawing near. Oftentimes, um, it can be very tempting to think of, of coming to, to this place, going to church, as a, an individual thing. I'm going to church. I'm coming to church. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to do this. I am going to do that. And while that's true, and while that is important, it's not the whole picture. That, that's not how worship worked in the Old Testament. That's not how worship works in the New Testament. See, even in the days that, that the book of Hebrews was written, way back in like the first century, some, you know, 1900 years ago, people were starting to think that worship was now just an individual thing. The curtain's gone, I can come up and worship. And while you can worship God wherever you are, there is something extra special about gathering together, about being here. Something something you can't get anywhere else. Something that, that causes the author to warn us to, to not neglect the gathering. The author of Hebrews, he wants us to see that when you come to church, you come to church for, for more than just you. Um, that we gather here in church. Not only because we have direct access to God, but as he says, to encourage one another. That, that person over there needs you, needs you to come to church for their sake, to encourage them. And that person over there needs you to come to, your, to church for their sake. And I need you to come to church to encourage me. And I come to church to, to encourage you. It's not just about me, it's about us. In the words of the author, don't neglect the gathering. The gathering of the assembly, that's what the word congregation means, is about exactly that. All of us. See, here in this chapter, in chapter 10, the camera turns and we see that worship is, is more than just what takes place up front. That worship is all of you drawing near together to Christ. Or as the words say in our text, all the more as the day is, is drawing near. What he's saying here is that we're getting steadily closer to the last day. There is this, this fixed number of days before Jesus comes back. And as we get closer to that last day, the world outside these walls is only going to get worse. 
It's going to get more and more and more and more evil. I don't have to give you examples. You can see them when you look around. But what that means is, for those of us inside, it gets harder to live our lives outside. And so we don't neglect the gathering. We gather together here to worship God, but to encourage one another, to help one another uh, run the race, to, to finish the fight, to, to make it to the end as a person of faith. And when Hebrews here speaks of encouragement, it's, it's not talking about like some, some cheesy motivational or self-help book you'd find in like a, like a gas station book selection. This isn't like 10 ways to organize your life or something like that. The encouragement that the author here is talking about, the encouragement he's talking about here is to tell each other about Jesus, to encourage one another about the blood of the Lamb, to teach others that, that, that Jesus loves you, um, that Jesus, the eternal Son of God, he became a real a flesh and blood person to offer his blood as a sacrifice and to give you access to the most holy place, and the place even holier than that, the access to God's eternal presence. Jesus has come, and now you have access to God. Your sins are washed away, even, even the secret ones, because God chooses not to remember them. Encourage one another with these words. Tell one another how the Lamb of God has taken away your sins. So, let's try it. All of you are sitting next to somebody right now. A family member, a friend, a stranger. I want all of us, and I'll do it too, to take a moment here to encourage one another. You can say something like, you know, isn't it great that Jesus has forgiven you? And he's forgiven me too. Or you could say, you know, I can't wait to see God and stand next to him together in heaven. Or something like that. Or you can even say something simpler. Jesus loves you. Or I'm so glad that Jesus died on the cross to save you. So we're going to do that now. I'll keep an eye on the clock and on you guys to make sure we're doing this. But let's do that. Well, uh, we're going to encourage one another with these kinds of words. On your marks. Get set. Go. Encourage one another. <laughs> the reality of gathering in this place, the, the spiritual reality of you being here, is that we receive the forgiveness of God, that we have direct access to the Father, that the curtain is gone, and that we also get to encourage one another. What happens here in this space is truly a remarkable thing. For here, God has made all of us, all, all of you, into one family that does not end. Here God has told you how much he loves you. Here God has forgiven you your sins. And so let us, in the words of the author of Hebrews, not neglect the gathering. Let's be encouraged by one another. And we know that, that when that happens, when we encourage each other, we know that God is here and he is with us. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds forever in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our service continues with the singing of our offertory found on page 192. Please rise.
Every so often, I like to, to remind people um, that our offerings have changed since the pandemic. Um, just as a reminder, the offering basket is in the back of the church now. We don't pass it at the pews. Um, you're welcome to leave offerings either on your way in or on your way out. But we're also strongly encouraging people to give online. But you can go to our website, stpaulsmelrose.org, and you can sign up for giving there on our website, um, which is much more convenient for everybody involved, um, so you can do that as well. Um, let's go to God in prayer. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We thank you, O Lord, our God and Father, for all of your goodnesses. We praise you especially for your everlasting covenant, which you have made with us through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grant that every good work which we do would be pleasing in your sight for his sake. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Preserve your church throughout the world, O Lord, and keep us ready at all times for your Son's glorious return. Lead us to proclaim with zeal his coming to the ends of the earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all pastors and missionaries, that they might preach the pure doctrine of God's saving word, which will never pass away. Give faith to all of those who hear it, that in Christ they might have the peace which passes all understanding. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Be with all of those who gather in this place. Strengthen them, encourage them, and use them to encourage one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Uphold all of those in authority, especially the President and Congress of these United States, the Governor and Legislature of Minnesota, and all judges. Graciously enable them to lead according to your will and for our good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks, Holy Lord, for the fruits of this earth provided by your hand. Supply the needs of all of those who grow, process, and distribute our food, and move us to share these bountiful gifts with our neighbors in their times of need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Behold the sick and the infirmed and all of those in need, especially this day we pray for Goldie, that you would bless her with comfort and love and healing, that you would give the doctors wisdom to know the best ways to help her. Be with her and those on the prayer list of this congregation and those in it before you in our hearts. Grant them healing of body and patience to endure their afflictions. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Give repentance and faith to all of those who approach this altar this day at Christ's gracious invitation. They might find favor in your eyes and receive his true body and blood for the salvation of their souls. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Grant this and whatever else you know that we need, O God, for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. For those of you joining us online today, um, I pray the Lord's blessings upon you. May the Lord bless and preserve your coming and going, and this time forward and forevermore. Amen. For those of us